Einstein. This is the second class in our first course created on purpose or evolved by chance. Is there scientific, historical, and logical reasons to believe that the Bible is true and God is the creator of the universe? In this class, we'll take a close look at the evidence for a worldwide flood as recorded in the historical record of the Bible. Let's get started. Okay, evidence three, marine fossils on the tops of mountains and far inland. Let's start off with a quick riddle. What was the highest mountain before they found Mount Everest? Uh, you got it? The answer is Mount Everest. Just because they hadn't found it yet didn't mean it wasn't the highest. Ha, ha, ha. Gotcha. And yet, what's the highest point described in the Bible? That would be Mount Ararat, which is just a little over half as tall as Mount Everest. And why is that? Probably because every single event described in the Bible took place inside this tiny red circle. That was the only world they knew. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, how high is Mount Everest? It is 29,000 feet or five and a half miles. What kind of fossils do they find on top of Mount Everest? Ocean animals. Now that's bizarre. Here's some pictures. This is a crinoid fossil. That's what it looks like when it's alive there on your right. And on the left is what it looks like fossilized. Uh, pretty amazing that they find these fossils on tops of Mount Everest. The fossils aren't found just on top of Mount Everest. They're found throughout the entire mountain in different spots. In fact, even the sediment on the top of Mount Everest is low-grade metamorphic rock that has been altered by heat and pressure. And you can't account for that if you think they were just deposited there by a worldwide flood. Now, where is Mount Everest located? There it is. I dropped it in. Uh, it is that little triangle there. It's over near uh, in Nepal, uh, near Bhutan, and it is about 450 miles to the beach, uh, the Bay of Bengal there. Now, live clams remain closed. Dead clams open up. Why do dead clams open up? Well, when a clam dies, the muscle relaxes, and it can no longer pull itself closed, so it opens up. Now, what's interesting is, all over the world, we have clams that are fossilized closed. Now, they're dead, so how can they be closed when a dead clam opens up? Ever hear the expression, digging for clams? They're found closed because clams spend pretty much all their life underground. If a clam dies and isn't exposed soon, it would remain closed and be fossilized in that way. What does it tell us? It means rapid burial, covered by enough weight to keep them from opening after they died. Here you see a brachiopod cluster in Kentucky. These are brachiopods found in the upper part of the Pipe Creek Junior Quarry in East Central Indiana. These are all over the place. Uh, tons of brachiopods or clams that are fossilized closed. This in and of itself is an incredible evidence of a worldwide flood. But brachiopods aren't clams. They're not even bivalves. They aren't actually in the same phyla. They may look the same to a young earth creationist, but brachiopods lack the ligament that when relaxed would open the shell if, if it dies. In fact, the Kentucky State fossil is the brachiopod. There are so many of them. After lobbying by students and teachers at a Louisville Middle School, the Kentucky State Legislator de designated the brachiopod as the Kentucky State fossil on July 15, 1986. With so many species of brachiopods found throughout the state, Kentucky decided to designate the entire group as its state fossil. Brachiopod shells are probably the most commonly collected fossil in Kentucky. Brachiopods had two shells and lived attached to the sea bottom or some object on the sea bottom. Now what's amazing is that the Kentucky is again 450 miles from the ocean. Now that, I don't know if that's a coincidence or what, that both Mount Everest and Kentucky are 450 miles from the ocean, but uh, that is the case. It's not coincidence at all. At the time those brachiopods were alive, they were covered with water and an inland sea. Now we're going to take a look at how Mount Everest formed and the real reason that we find fossils there.
plate tectonics is observable and measurable, and unlike Kevin's idea of how this came about, it's backed by science. Hundreds of thousands of marine creatures were buried with amphibians, spiders, scorpions, millipedes, insects, and reptiles in a fossil graveyard uh, in France, which is 300 miles from the ocean. Okay, here's a, a map of it. Uh, you can see the little red mark there where they found these fossils, and that is 300 miles from the ocean. And we know that at many different times in the past, what is now called France was covered with ocean. More than 100,000 fossil specimens representing more than 400 species have been recovered from a shale layer associated with coal beds in the Maison Creek area in Chicago. This spectacular fossil graveyard includes ferns, insects, scorpions, and tetrapods buried with jellyfish, mollusks, crustaceans, and fish, often with soft body parts exquisitely preserved. Here it is again. Uh, and here's what the Earth looked like 300 million years ago when those fossils were formed. What is now the Chicago area was part of the ocean. At Fluorescent, Colorado, a wide variety of insects, freshwater mollusks, fish, birds, and several hundred plant species, including nuts and blossoms, are buried together. Bees and birds have to be buried rapidly in order to be so well preserved. Alligator fish, including sunfish, deep sea bass, chubs, pickerel, herring, and gar pike, three to seven feet long, birds, turtles, mammals, mollusks, crustaceans, many varieties of insects, and palm leaves, seven to nine feet long, were buried together in the vast green river formation of Wyoming. The fluorescent fossil formation is 34 million years old. One of the cool things about it is it's all freshwater species. We don't see any marine species included at all with the fossils. I've been collecting and studying Green River fossils for years. Here's part of my collection. Here's a Green River fish that I prepped myself, showing a before and after of what it looked like. One of the coolest things about the Green River fossils are the annual varves. Each one of these layers took a year to lay down, and there are millions of them throughout the formation. You can see the layers here under magnification. Now, get this, this is a thousand miles from the ocean uh, where they found all these sea, sea creatures. What's interesting too is that they found both freshwater and saltwater uh, sea uh, animals. There's a picture of it. You can see it right there. That is 1,000 miles from the ocean. I don't know where he got this information because, to my knowledge, no marine fossils have ever been found in either of the formations he just mentioned. The area where the Green River Formation fossils were formed was once an area of inland lakes completely separated from the ocean. 300 whales, porpoises, turtles, seals, fish, and land animals such as ground sloths and penguins were catastrophically buried together near Peru in South America in the Pisco Formation, which is 36 miles from the ocean. So this isn't just one place in the world where this happens. It's everywhere. It's all over the place. And so again, this just screams worldwide flood. The truth is, all the fossils we see are separated by different eras and by different geographical locations. This all supports the theory of plate tectonics and the theory of evolution, and not a worldwide flood. Here is the whale fossil, one of the whale fossils they found. Gigantic whale fossil here. You can see it there. Over 60 whale fossils were found 80 miles from the ocean in the desert of Chile in South America in 2010 when construction crews were expanding the Pan American Highway. Also buried with the whales were dolphins and sloths. Now, I'm not sure what's the deal with sloths. They keep finding sloths. I thought they were slow, but whatever. Maybe that's why they got caught up in the flood. <clears throat> Here again is another picture of it. You can see all the whale fossils they found. And there's another picture. Research by geologists and paleontologists show that the area was once a shallow estuary and that the whales, dolphins, and yes, even the aquatic sloths died because of a toxic algae bloom. I'm guessing that Kevin didn't know there was such a thing as aquatic sloths. Okay, moving on to evidence five, geological features that look like they were caused by a flood. I'm going to start off this section with a clip from the Nova series on the mystery of the mega flood. They're going to discuss the formation of the Scablands, which covers 16,000 square miles in Washington state. And what this demonstrates is that even secular geologists are coming to the conclusion that the features we see on the earth were caused 
by a flood, by gigantic floods, not by the, the normal process of wind and rain and, and the sunshine eroding things. For a long time, it was assumed that the Scablands features would have taken millions of years to create. The rivers and lakes in the Scablands today could not have sculpted this landscape. This water is part of a modern irrigation system and was not here when the Scablands were created. The only river big enough and old enough is the Columbia, which is 50 miles away. And there is no evidence it ever flowed through the Scablands. But there's another reason to rule rivers out. No river in the world can form what you are about to see. You will not find these anywhere else on Earth. These enormous potholes are one of the strangest geological features on the planet. If I was on the bottom of a big river like the Columbia, I might find some potholes that were maybe a few feet across, a few feet deep. But this feature, this rock basin, of which there are hundreds in the channeled scab land, is about 10 times as big as the potholes that we find in even a large river like the Columbia. It's very clear just from the size of the feature that this was not made by normal river processes. But if not rivers, then what formed this landscape? Boulders like this one pointed toward another possible culprit. How could this 100-ton giant have been dumped on the edge of this 1,000-foot precipice? It's made of granite, and granite is not native to the Scablands. But granite boulders of many different sizes are scattered erratically throughout the area. Indeed, they are known as erratics. So the two main theories to explain the gradual formation of this landscape just didn't work. River erosion could not explain giant potholes and ice was too remote from the Scablands to create these hanging valleys. During the 1920s, a geologist named J. Harlan Bretz outlined a theory of what he thought had really happened to the Scablands. But Bretz's theory defied all scientific convention. He claimed, he claimed the Scablands were not the result of a slow geological evolution but of an enormous catastrophe that had happened almost overnight. For years, Bretts traveled the Scablands examining the landscape. Eventually, one feature would clinch his argument, although it would take him decades to recognize it. From ground level, these shapes don't make much sense. Bretz must have walked over thousands of those things, but they're so big in the field, he had no idea what they were. He just, uh, he, didn't, he didn't guess what they were. Bretz would not see aerial photographs of these hills for many years. But we can see from the air how these shapes begin to look like ripples, a giant version of the ripples left behind on the beach by the sea. How could a rushing mass of water create canyons that look as if they were eroded over millions of years? 
like this one, known as Dry Falls, 20 times the size of Niagara Falls. How could water transport these giant erratics that are normally carved out by glaciers? And how could it form these strange potholes found here on such a monumental scale? To test whether a single flood coming from Lake Missoula could really have done all this, scientists have built their own mini scablands. Here, the Earth Surface Dynamics team at the University of Minnesota has constructed a scale model of the scablands and poured water over it to represent the failure of glacial Lake Missoula. Here it comes. The rushing water doesn't simply disperse over a wide area. It gouges out channels and then erodes them into extraordinary shapes. It is only when the water is turned off that the significance of these shapes becomes clear. We're seeing the same essential set of processes. In fact, it's one of the remarkable things about these natural systems is that the same fundamental sets of processes can occur across a very wide range of scales. They're what we call scale independent. For years, scientists argued that the features of the scab lands could not have been formed overnight. But this model clearly shows miniature versions of the canyons found in the scab lands. Just like the real ones, they look as if they were gradually eroded. In fact, they were carved out in seconds. That sure was a great clip. But what I find the most interesting here is that Kevin Conover doesn't acknowledge that those scientists also determined it happened multiple times. Not only did it happen multiple times, it happened long before he believes the Earth was even created. Here's another big one. This is Arches National Park. That's one of the largest arches in Arches National Park. Why aren't there any more arches forming in Arches National Park? One of the most photographed freestanding arches in Arches National Park, Wall Arch, in southeast Utah, collapsed sometime late Monday or early Tuesday of August 4th and 5th, 2008. No one reported seeing it collapse. The arch is located along the popular Devil's Garden Trail and was more than 33 feet tall and 71 feet across before collapse. It was the 12th largest arch of the estimated 2,000 arches in Arches, arches National Park. The collapse of such arches provides evidence that long freestanding arches and many tall natural bridges likely formed rapidly during the flood. Why is that? Well, if these were formed through natural processes that we see today, then there would still be new arches forming. But there aren't any new arches forming. There's only arches breaking down. And eventually, all the arches are going to be broken. And so they're going to have to rename the park Broken Arches National Park. Very sad. So get over there before they're all gone. But who says they aren't forming today? The Sahara Desert is just a few million years old, yet it contains lots of natural arches. The Pathfinder landing happened in 1997. Uh, the, the robot, the Sojourner, landed on Mars. It was absolutely a phenomenal event. And according to the, a write-up, uh, they said here the landing site was an ancient floodplain in Mars's northern hem hemisphere called Ares Valleys, the Valley of Ares, the ancient Greek equivalent of the ancient Roman deity Mars, and is among the rockiest parts of Mars. Scientists chose it because they found it to be a relatively safe surface to land on and one that contained a wide variety of rocks deposited during a catastrophic flood. Now here's what's very interesting. The scientists are very quick to recognize water on Mars. They said that there was a giant flood here, which I believe is actually correct. If you look at the, the terrain, what you see here is rocks scattered everywhere. This is a normal after a flood because the boulders get picked up by the water and basically dropped in various places uh, very sporadically. This isn't formed by wind and rain or the sun. Uh, you don't have boulders just form like that. 
It's formed by a flood. But why don't they recognize this when we see this type of thing on Earth? Here is Yosemite. Look at the rocks just scattered on the tops of Yosemite. These are on the tops of huge mountains. And here they are, rocks just scattered haphazardly. Why don't they credit these with a the flood? Because they're better explained as glacial erratics. They were formed by moving glaciers, not running water. Here's north central Washington. Look at the rocks all scattered all throughout. Now, hugefloods.com actually is a website dedicated to the idea that this was created by a gigantic flood. Sure they are, just not a worldwide flood or a biblical flood like you believe. They talk about lots of different huge floods. Here is a dry riverbed on Mars. This was uh, uh, an article by Jason Kobler uh, saying that the European Space Agency discovers a striking ancient river on Mars. This image by the European Space Agency shows the real valleys on Mars. The European Space Agency announced Thursday that it has taken high-definition pictures of an ancient river nearly 1,000 miles long on Mars. Um, and so, what about Earth? If we look down out of an airplane on Earth, what do we see? Was that a dramatic pause, or were we supposed to answer? So is this right here caused by millions of years of erosion, or is it caused by a worldwide flood? This is in uh, Cappadocia, Turkey. Here's another one. This is uh, Nam Nambia. Namibia. This is a rock formation. And is that caused by millions of years of erosion, or is that caused by a worldwide flood stacking those rocks on top of one another? I wasn't able to locate any research on that specific formation he shows, but it may or may not have formed naturally. I'm glad he brought it up, though, because I often drive past piles of large granite boulders. Some of them really look like they're stacked one on top of each other. I'm on my way to northern Arizona on Highway 87 between Phoenix and Payson. Many times I've heard creationists claim these could only be formed by a worldwide flood. If you look at road cuts in the area, you can see the layer of granite that lies underneath where the rocks are exposed. That's visible here in image number two. In image number three, you can see right below the pile of rounded rocks, a piece of granite with all the cracks running through it. Over a long period of time, rain seeps down in the cracks in the rocks and chemical weathering turns them into rounded edges. Eventually the cracked granite will also become rounded rock and some of the rocks above will become balanced on top of them. Image number four was taken just a short distance away where the granite is still covered by sediment. Now if this were caused by a worldwide flood, we would expect to see these granite boulders strewn across the whole area and not just in the area where the granite is exposed. If you see rocks stacked like this, sometimes they could be ancient cairns or they could be people stacking rocks as markers. These rocks are obviously stacked by people and in my opinion it's ugly and destroys the look of the entire landscape. Right here, this is Monument Valley, Utah, on the border of Arizona. Is this millions of years of erosion, or did water rush through here, ripping everything out and leaving these little uh, stacks of, uh, uh, of rock and dirt? Millions of years of erosion. Here's another one, Bryce Canyon in Utah. You want to tell me this was formed by the wind and the rain? I don't think so. Wind, rain, chemical weathering, and lots of freezing and thawing over millions of years. This is Tapu Island in Thailand. Uh, completely ripped off from the main part of the uh, of the island. Uh, so was this millions of years of erosion? I don't think so. All over the world we have geological evidence for a worldwide flood. Certainly looks like erosion over time to me. Every example he has shown us ha can be explained by natural processes. Not a single one would need a worldwide flood to occur. That's all for this video. There will be one more on Noah's Flood in this series before we move on to the age of the Earth.